Final Quest is written in rounded binary, ABA prime. The A section goes all the way until measure 40, where we get a retardando into an andante. Then the A section comes back in measure 65, and there's no accelerando. It just happens at, at, at 65, and, and that's going to create a challenge, and I'll give you some strategies on how to make your orchestra lock in. It's just first violins playing at 65, so we'll, we'll give you some strategies on how to make sure they're all playing the 16th notes in their tempo. Now, in measure 65, we retain the key signature of the B theme, so it's not identical to the opening A theme. We're now in some kind of a D major situation instead of D minor. Now, there's a lot of modality mixed in with this, but Generally speaking, D minor to D major. The key change here from the um, minor section to the major section in A prime is going to change a lot of the finger patterns. So just from day one, it, you know, you're going to want to go over these finger patterns anyway because you're going to want your orchestra to play in tune. And you're going to want to learn all of these finger patterns fluidly before you even start reading the piece. Okay. And then you need to make sure that they understand when those finger patterns change from the D minor section to the D major section. And a lot of times when orchestras play this piece, they don't understand that there was a key change and, or they don't understand how that key change has affected the finger patterns. And so you end up with either wrong notes or out of tune notes or, or things like that. So you have to make it clear to them what finger patterns that they're going to be using and, and how to change them. When you have sections that are shifting into different positions, that's going to change the finger pattern too. A lot of times when they're shifting to third position, they're going to be going into an augmented pattern, especially here at the andante section because we're transitioning D major. So when they shift up into third position, they're going to have that high third finger because they're going to be in an augmented pattern or 3-4 pattern depending on the nomenclature that you like to use. And students need to be comfortable with that finger pattern as well. So we set them up to be able to go from the minor finger patterns, some of the open finger patterns that they had before, to the aug augmented finger patterns that they have in the B theme. Now these augmented patterns are, are going to stay the same um, when the A theme returns at 65, and we need to make sure that they're still playing those patterns, you know, same patterns in first position, same patterns in third positions, and make sure that they understand which pattern to use and that they can do those in tune. All right, so key changes in the piece can create problems. It can create problems with wrong notes if they miss the key, and it also can create problems with the intonation if they are playing a piece of music and they're not comfortable with that finger pattern. They didn't practice it as much as they did. You know, when, when you are rehearsing a, a piece of music, a lot of the times, you know, you just oh, let's start at measure one, you just go. And so they get a lot more repetition with the a theme in D minor than they are with the A prime theme in D major. And so you get there and it's like, why is this so out of tune? It's not just because of the key change, it's because of the rehearsal sequence. So make sure to spend just as much time on A prime as you do on A and that they make the adjustments to the finger patterns. All right, so a lot of times when we have a piece of music, the, the problems are going to occur during the transition. So when we're getting into B, when we're getting back into A, those are the areas where orchestras are likely to fall apart or have a lot of problems. So make sure that you work those um, more than the thematic stuff. Okay, so let's take a look. When we're getting into 40, we have a retardando. Okay, so the tempo's slowing down, and then we're in at 40. And th this is fairly easy to set up again because, you know, seconds in, in, in the violas, you can be patient with that retardando. It's not going to slow down right up front. But on beats three and four, it's all first violins playing the eighth notes, and everybody else is sustaining. And so you only have to worry about one section following you until you get the tempo established at 40. Now, when things are written this way, you, you got to be able to interpret it a little bit. You have to say, okay, are we slowing down to 80 from 110 to 80? That's 30 beats per minute. It's, it's not a lot. Okay, or are we slowing down beyond 80 and then new tempo change at, at 40? So you slow down from 110 to, let's say, 58 and then 80 in measure 40. Is that, is that what you want? So you got to make an interpretation there and make sure that you do it the same way every time. Don't say, oh, let's play with it this way. Oh, let's play with it that way. Make up your mind and do it that way 
um, so that there's no confusion about that, how that transition is going to happen. Now, this is a lot easier than the next transition that we're going to have getting into the A theme again in measure 64. Okay, and this is because there's no accelerando. They first plans just have to be able to find the tempo at measure 65. Okay, so the way I like to do this is I, I like to use what's called passive conducting. Okay, so if you're a conductor, you don't have to conduct every beat. You're not a human metronome. Okay, you have some flexibility and you can give the students what they need and you don't have to give them stuff they don't need. Okay, so what they, what they don't need is they don't need you to, to beat one, two, three, four, and then guess the new tempo. It's not as clear. So you can use some passive conducting on beat three and give a prep beat into the new tempo. Okay, so it's one, two, three, and then give the new tempo that way. Now, you also want to make sure that when you're doing this, that you turn and look right at the first violins and you cue them right in when they're supposed to. Lots of eye contact. Don't bury your head in the score. Don't have them bury their heads in the music, okay? They're sustaining a C, okay? Okay, you know what's coming. It's still C, it's still C, and then, you know, and then they've got the Ds. It, it's easy to memorize it, you know, they can, they can watch you. But they can watch you, but, but you can also be clear. Okay, so towards the end, the final four measures, we have a rollentando leading into the final four measures of the, of the piece here. And this, this can be even trickier because, you know, you, you got to get your cellos to establish those 16th notes, but there's a lot of rhythmic stuff here that, that can get all messed up too if, if you don't get the tempo established. So same kind of idea at 94. You use your passive conducting, okay? So one, two, hold... Okay, and then give, give beat one right in the new tempo. Look right at your cello section. Look right at them, and then give them the tempo. Okay, so one, two, hold cellos. Okay, and, and that's what's going to make the cellos come in right, and everybody else can lock in to their subdivision of the beat to find where the and a three is. Getting back to the Sandante section again, the, the transition is usually not the problem. However, you'll hear orchestras in 42 and 43 where those 16th notes just aren't established and you end up with phasing problems. A lot of times they'll end up rushing through there. And you got to ask yourself, well, why is that? Is it the transition? No, it's not necessarily the transition. It's the bowing that happens in 4041. Cellos and basses have these whole notes here in 40 and 41, and yet at 42, they have 16th notes. Now, if you watched my video on the detache 16th notes and how to set those up, and I hope you did, it's, it's important that everybody in the orchestra plays those in the middle of the bow. Now, they're not likely to get back to the middle of the bow on a whole note up bow. So what we have to do is we have to use a lighter, faster bow in measure 40 on that whole note, and then a heavier, slower bow in 41, it doesn't have to be too heavy because we're mezzo piano here. Um, and it, we are phrasing up here um, because we got a four bar phrase from, from uh, 40 to 44. So, you know, you do need to use some phrasing here. Um, so, you know, the, the, that whole phrase is mezzo piano, not just, um, you know, every, every individual note in the phrase, the, the entirety of the phrase is mezzo piano. So we got to keep that in mind too. But the goal is to make it back to the middle of the bow for 42, and we got to slow the bow down and use more weight to do so. Okay, same thing in measure 46. You know, we've got this whole note, whole note. We're going to use the same bowing strategy here to make sure that we're in the right part of the bow and that we can continue the phrase. Now, with, with this phrase, it's written backwards of the first one. You know, first we're crescendoing, and then we, the cellos and basses come in, and then there's a two-measure diminuendo, whereas here... We got a two measure. We got two measures, and it's not indicated what they do. But then, you know, they they want they want the cellos basses to crescendo for a measure, and then it's only one measure now instead of two measures. So we have this asymmetry here. So so that that's very interesting. So the way you phrase that, you know, is going to be kind of up to you. But make sure that you pick a way to do it. Don't just play everything so stale and stagnant. Find a phrasing scheme, write it in, and make sure that all of your students have it written in as well. All right, moving on ahead. In, in the B theme. And, and the reason why I'm spending so much time on the B theme is because, you know, the, the material in the A themes, although they're in different keys, it's similar material. And so if you play through the piece and play through the piece and play through the piece, you're, you're going to get more repetition with that material than the B theme. So it's important to figure out what the challenges are 
in, in, in the B section, sorry, I've been saying B theme, B section, so that, that uh, the students get enough exposure to where they can make it sound just as good as the A sections. So, so here in 52-53, similar thing. We've got to make it back to the middle of the bow. However, um, in, in 53, it's half notes instead of whole notes. So we've got to think similarly to what we did with the whole notes. You know, um, faster, long, uh, faster, lighter down bow, a little bit heavier um, up bow so we can get right back to the center of the, of the bow uh, in measure 54. Now, our dynamic level has changed also. We're now piano instead of mezzo piano. So we, got, we also have to take it down and use a little bit lighter bows on both notes. But the students just need to manage their, their bow distribution and make sure that they're where they're supposed to be in 54, 55. Okay? Same, same kind of phrasing scheme that we had before. It's just, you know, now it's half notes. And instead of whole notes, measure um, 56, 57, 58, three bar phrase. Okay? And then we crescendo on the, on the last bar of the phrase. Um, so same thing in 57. We, we got to manage our bow so that violas and cellos can be in the middle of the bow and they can stay together. Now, this is going to be more difficult because your violas are going to tend to be in the upper half of the bow and cellos are going to tend to be in the lower half of the bow. So you, you got to literally meet right in the middle so that everybody's in the same part of the bow or else there could be phasing going on. So again, with, with every piece of music, you, you look at it and you can flip through it, look at its structure, look at its form, and you can start to predict um, where the problems are going to be. And it's not necessarily like, oh, there's 16th notes, that's going to be the problem. Okay, sometimes, but sometimes th there are technical problems that, that are difficult to manage because of the transitions and stuff. And, and it makes the piece very interesting. And, and um, you know, if you have a piece that's just completely straightforward, it can be kind of boring. And, and one of the things that attracts people to this piece is the complexity that's used to write it. And that's, that's what makes it fun. And that, that's what, you know, draws many, many string orchestras to, to play this piece, but you got you to manage that, you know. It, it's got a lot of contrast, you have to manage the contrast. And so pay attention to those transitions, particularly, um, you know, four before the end, to, to make sure that that's managed very well.